something different. He's doing something new. He's doing it in the church. He's doing it through you. And so if you're here, it's a good time to be here. If you know that God is moving. And so one of the things you just heard about was our, our chance we're going to get, again, to help bless our community down in Burlington City. We started a project there a month or so ago in, in, in partnership with a church, of our, a church friend of ours from Florence and another area where we started working on a fence down there, painting a fence. Now, if you've ever been down to the waterfront in Burlington City, that's a long fence, all right? And so we got a little bit done. There's a whole lot more to do. So, and you don't have to be good at painting because trust me, I was there and we painted stuff. And that's the whole point. They just want to paint it. So if you have any time or you can be there the whole time this coming Saturday, May 4th, um, from 9 to 1, we're going to continue to work on that, have fun together as we do it, and build bridges into our community to show them, hey, we love them, and we want to be here to serve and bless. And and I I would tell you that uh, when we did it last time, I had a really good conversation with a township worker that was there, and he he remembered us. And so I think it's just God's using it to build bridges. So if you can join us uh, next Saturday for a little while or all of it, we would love to have you do that. Um, but it's part, of, it's part of what we're trying to do here at Grace. Right? It's part of trying to say, hey, listen, we don't exist just for us. The church isn't here just so we can have something to do on a Sunday morning. <laughs> it isn't something we can do so like, hey, let's get all the people. But we're not building this kingdom. We're trying to build God's kingdom. And that involves bridges. That involves going inside our comfort zone. That involves going to where we can serve and, and bless people for no other reason than just to say, hey, God loves you and so do we. You know, and that's, and that's what we're trying to establish here through different partnerships we've had, and you'll hear more as we go about doing that. So we're going to continue to do that, and I hope you'll be a part of it. And it leads into this new series that we're starting today. And you see it on the screen there. We're going to talk in the next couple weeks this idea of how to neighbor, all right? So you might be thinking, all right, well, I've heard of a neighbor as a noun. Like, I know I have a next-door neighbor, maybe, or a neighbor across the street or whatever, but I've never heard of it as a verb. Like, what does it mean to neighbor? Well, let's listen. We, we change some things around here sometimes, and so we're making neighbor a verb for the next couple of weeks. Okay, this is something that we do. It's not just somebody we live next to. Because that's kind of what Scripture teaches. That's what, that's what Jesus talks about when he talks about neighboring. He talks about loving people. He talks about what does it mean to be around people and show them the love of Jesus. Those are your neighbors. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at that. We're going to talk about that idea of how do we neighbor well? <laughs> how do we be people who actually love our neighbors like Jesus talks to us about? What, what is that? It's an It's an action. It's not on accident, right? Now, if you have next-door neighbors, which many of us do, you didn't get to choose them. (laughs) Some of you may wish you did get to choose them. I know that in our neighborhood, we have neighbors on all sides of us, and and we get along great with most of them, but there are times when you're like, it would just be easier if you didn't live next door to me. I mean, just let's be honest, you know? When your dog comes into our yard thinking it's a bathroom, I don't like that so much. You know, like you have to, you work through those things with your neighbors because they're, they're there, right? But the idea of a neighbor is not so much just who's on the other side of the fence from you. The idea of the neighbor is who are you, who are you showing the love of Jesus to? Who does Jesus define as our neighbor? And then what do we do about going about living our lives in a way that we are neighboring people the way that we were called to neighbor people, the way Jesus teaches us to neighbor people. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this next couple of weeks, this series, because we really do believe that showing the love of Jesus, going out and being good neighbors, neighboring the people around us is super important to how we live out our faith, because that's how Jesus defined it. And so we're going to actually look at a story today as we kick off this series where somebody asked that very important question, you know, who is my neighbor? And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at Luke chapter 10. There's a story in there that you probably are familiar with if you've been in church at all or have heard people talk about, but there's this, this story in there, and so it's, it's a story that Jesus tells about a, a guy who defines being a good neighbor. And so, it, so in the background of the story, Jesus is, there, there's, a, uh, there, there's an occasion where it says in verse 25 of chapter 10 that an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. So Jesus gets this a lot in his life, okay? If you read the Bible, a lot of guys try to, especially the Pharisees, experts in the law, kind of the same thing, they always try to stump Jesus. That's kind of their main goal, right? They want to make him look bad. So they're always trying to ask him questions that are like, okay, if I can get him to answer this wrong, we can, we can show people he's not who he says he is, right? So this guy stands up and he wants to try to stump Jesus. So he asks him a question. He says, he says teacher, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's basically saying, okay, Jesus, tell me what do I have to do to have eternal life? So this is Luke chapter 10, starting in verse uh, 25. It, he's saying, what do I have to do to inter- inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, okay, well, what, you're a teacher of the law. You, you're, you're good. you should know what this says. What does the law say? What's written? And he says, okay, well, Here's what it says. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus goes, great, excellent answer. Ding, ding, ding. Like, good job. Now go do that. That's kind of how this conversation goes. And then this guy 
and does something that I think he, he makes the same that a lot of us want to try to make when we, we try to figure out what he's saying. He wants to justify himself. So in verse 29, the man being the, the, the teacher of the law, wanting to make sure that he got this right, wanting to make sure that people knew that he was going to do it the right way, asks a very pointed and important question. And who is my neighbor? So he's saying, listen, I get that the law says I'm supposed to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. But Jesus, what I want you to do now is I want you to find for me who my neighbor actually is. Because I need to know that description so I know the type of person that I actually have to love. The type of person I actually have to get along with. Is it the type of person that likes the same music I do? Because Lord knows I like the best music, right? Is it the type of person that, you know, looks like me? Is it the type of person that, that doesn't look like me? Is it someone with tattoos or earrings or, or different, like, what is it, different color skin? Like, what does that look like, Jesus? I want to know. Give me an answer. Show me, define for me exactly what I have to do in this scenario. Now, a lot of us may be like this teacher of the law. We just kind of want Jesus to lay it out for us, right? Just, just God, just, just give me a description. Just tell me exactly what I have to do. Make it known, make it very, very clear to me. Okay, this is the person. They look like this, they live here, like that's my neighbor. Okay, good, check it off. Now I know what I need to do. We want Jesus to, to tell us that all the time. Just tell us what to do, Jesus. Just tell us what to do, God, so I can just make sure I'm doing it right. So I can make sure that I'm, I'm making sure everybody knows that I'm good at this thing. And Jesus almost never does that, <laughs> right? If you, read the, if you read the Bible, Jesus almost never answers people exactly how they want to be answered, does he? Because he goes after what's really going on underneath. He doesn't just take the surfacey stuff. He goes for what's underneath. And so what we're going to find is, instead of Jesus going, okay, you're right. Let me tell you who your neighbor is. They're five foot seven, blue eyes, blonde hair. Their name is Joe. That's the guy you got to love. It's not what Jesus does. Instead, it's funny because he doesn't even tell people who to neighbor. When, we, when he answers this guy, he doesn't tell people who to neighbor. He shows people how to neighbor. When we read this story, you got to understand, he's not saying this is who you do. He says this is how you do this thing. He tells the guy a story about what neighboring really should look like. Right? So he's not saying this is the person. He's saying this is how you do this thing. This guy wanted to know who. Jesus shows him how. And very often that's what Jesus does. If you read the Gospels and what he does to us when he teaches us, he doesn't just say, hey, do this. He says, hey, let's, let's learn how to actually think. Right? As, as, as believers and as Christians, and even when I was a youth pastor, my goal was always not to tell people what to think. It was always try to help them learn how to think. That's a big deal, guys. When we come to understand Jesus and Scripture, we don't just need to know exactly the right answer so we can move on. We've got to learn how to think about these things that Jesus is teaching us. So when it comes to being a good neighbor, we've got to learn how to do this. So Jesus tells him a story, because Jesus is an awesome storyteller, and he loves to use stories. And so he tells him a story about this guy who's traveling down from, from, from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho when he gets, falls into the hands of robbers and gets beat up and left for dead. And that was a pretty common occurrence in that day because from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jerusalem was about 2,500 feet above sea level. Jericho was about 800 feet below sea level, and they were 17 miles apart. So the traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho was not just a smooth ride. You weren't just going to hop in like a Jerusalem Uber and get there in five minutes. It was, it, was, it was downhill, it was rocky, it was rough, it was dangerous terrain. And by the way, it was the perfect place if you're going to mug somebody to do it. <laughs> because, and it was known for that. It had, a, it had a reputation. That stretch of road had a reputation of being dangerous. Because people would. They'd hang out behind a rock, they'd wait for somebody to be coming on their own, you know, at dusk or at dark, and they'd jump out and they'd rob them and they'd sometimes kill them or leave them mostly dead on the side of the road. And so people would have understood that scenario Jesus was talking about right here. So he's saying, hey, this happened to somebody. And there was, you know, maybe they just heard that in the news, you know, six o'clock news in Jerusalem. Oh, there's another guy on the road that got beat up. People would have been used to that story. So he tells them, hey, this happened. But then he goes in a little bit deeper in the story. There's this guy laying on the side of the road, and he talks about people that are passing him by. And the first person he talks about is a priest. He said, a priest comes by, sees the guy left half for dead, and crosses the street to the other side and keeps going. Now, if you know anything about priesthood back in the Bible, that, that could sort of make sense because, you know, if a priest touches a bloody body or somebody's been beaten up, he would be ceremonially unclean, you know, and he wouldn't be able to go to work that day. 
he'd have to call off and go, you know, and do the rituals he needed to do to be clean again, and it would, it would mess up his day to help that guy. So sometimes, you know, okay, the priest, eh, I'd love to help, but I'm, I, I got to go to work, and I can't mess up my day. The next person that comes by is a Levite, he says. Now, a Levite was basically like a priest's apprentice, if you want to think of it that way. They worked in the temple, too. They weren't the priests, but they were kind of like the guys that helped out doing all the holy stuff in the temple. And he kind of did this, he kind of investigates and is like, yeah, it moves on as well. So nobody's helping this guy. They see him, but nobody's helping this guy. And then Jesus says something and says three words that would have shocked everybody there listening to him. Verse 33, he says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Those three words, but a Samaritan, would have been jaw-dropping to the rest of the crowd listening. Because it was a Jewish man you were talking about, and Samaritans and Jews hated each other. It's like saying, if you could pick the worst enemy of somebody else to throw in this scenario and saying they were the one to go help him, that's what he did. See, Jews and Samaritans had a 700-year hate fest going on at that point. It started a long time, 700 years earlier, when, when the Jewish people were taken into captivity, and most of them left, but a few stayed behind. And when they stayed behind, they intermarried with the people around them, non-Jews, people who worshipped other gods. And as they intermarried with them, they started having kids. And they were having kids who were different races mixed together, in a sense. And the Jewish people looked at them sort of as half-breeds. And they sort of worshipped God, but they also worshipped other gods. And so there was, this, there was this tension that Samaritans weren't real Jews, even though they had Jewish blood in them, because they were mixed. And so you had real Jews and you had them. And so when the Jews started hating the Samaritans, the Samaritans do what we all do. They just started hating them right back because that's what you do, right? And so for 700 years, they, these guys were just hating on each other. And so when Jesus says, but a Samaritan stopped to help this dude, everyone, we all go, yeah, okay, that's no big deal. Back then they would have been like, what? No way. I know a Samaritan. He would not do that, right? They would have, they would have, they would have really been shocked by that statement. But that's what Jesus was trying to do. Because he's trying to get to the, the, the base of this guy's question with, who is my neighbor? And he says, listen, that's not the right question. Let's talk about how to do this thing. So he tells him this story about the Samaritan who came over to the Jewish guy when the other two Jewish guys didn't even want to help their own guy. They didn't even want to pay attention to him. And the verse 34 says, the guy went to him, he bandaged up his wounds, he poured oil and wine on it, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Took care of him. Put oil and wine on, because back then oil and wine was medicinal, to help cover his wounds, to help take care of it. Then he put him on his own donkey, which means that he didn't get to ride the donkey, so he's walking, trucking this guy to an inn, and he takes him there, and then this guy takes care of him. He didn't just leave him at the end. Sometimes, maybe if you've heard this story before, you get this picture that he just like dropped him off and ran away. He stayed with the guy and he helped take care of him at this place. And in that description of what the guy did, what the Samaritan did for this man who was half dead, we get an amazing picture of what it means to neighbor somebody else. Now, there, there is a, there's a quote that Dr. Martin Luther King used in one of his sermons that, about the Good Samaritan that I love. And it goes like this, and he's talking about this story. He says, the first question the priest and Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the good Samaritan flipped that on its head. He reversed it, and he asked the question, if I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? You got to get that. The first two guys were like, this is all about me, and he's messing up my schedule. What will happen to me if I tell? I'll be unclean. I might not get to do this. I... Me, 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 they're thinking, and I got to avoid that guy. The Good Samaritan goes, you know what? If I don't stop and help this, what's going to happen to him? And when you hear that statement and the way he puts it, that's the essence of the gospel, by the way. That's the essence of what Jesus teaches us to do, is to love other people in such a way that we care about them more than ourselves, especially if they're different than us, even if they're different than us. To say, listen, it's not about, well, how will this impact how I feel? How will this impact me and my reputation? How will this impact what it does? No, 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 no. What's going to happen to them if I don't love them? If I don't help them? If I don't 
tell them about Jesus? What's going to happen to them? That's a great question to ask, isn't it? When we're talking about how to be a neighbor, that's a question we all got to start asking ourselves. If we're going to be good neighbors, if we're going to neighbor people the way Jesus talks about, the questions we got to not ask ourselves is, well, how is this going to inconvenience me? The question we got to ask ourselves is, what's going to happen to them if I don't? That's a great question. So when we're talking about how to neighbor, the first thing we got to get is you got to be willing to just cross the street. I mean, that seems simple, right? But it's the truth. You got to be willing to cross the street. You got to be willing to say, you know what? It's not going to mess with my schedule so much. It's not going to, it's not going to affect me in such a way. I, I, I'm willing because here's what the priest and the Levite did. They said, oh, you're really hurt. You're, you're somebody I don't really like that much. And I don't really, you know, I, I don't know anything about you. Uh, you might you look Jewish, but I don't really know your story. So I'm going to walk. You're there. I'm going to walk this way. I'm going to cross over the street. Jesus makes a point to tell people that they went out of their way to avoid him. It wasn't just like, oh, oh, and they were like stepping over his body. They like went way out of their way to not even be near this dude. They crossed the other side. They walked away from him. The Samaritan, the most, least likely of all people to do this, saw the guy. He crossed the street to get to him. He went over to him. They were busy walking away. He was walking towards. To be a good neighbor, we have to stop walking away from people. We have to start walking towards people. Too many of us are busy trying to walk away into our own personal, we got this going on, we got that going on. Jesus is like, oh, slow your roll. Start recognizing the people you need to start walking towards. Who do you need to cross the street for? And the better question is, why don't we? You ever ask yourself that question? Maybe you've heard a sermon that's challenged you this way before and you're like, yeah, that's good. But what's really underneath that? Why don't we cross the street? Because I think honestly, and this might be a little, you know, if I'm stepping on people's toes then today, I apologize. Not really. I'm doing it on purpose. But it, when we, why don't we cross the street? I think that there are, I think that we got to start to look at our lives and identify prejudices and biases that we have that keep us from loving people the way we're supposed to. I know that that word in this city's culture, prejudice, and by, like, it's, a, it's a big, heavy, deep word. And I, and I can't stand up here as, as a person that looks like I do and say that I've had a lot of experience with it, the way some maybe you guys even have different experiences of that feeling. And I, I'm not minimalizing any of that, but I think that we've done a really bad job of identifying in our own lives what keeps us from being that person that would cross the street to help somebody else. I think a lot of us go, well, I'm not, I, I'm not prejudiced. I would never have anything like that going on. Well, Here's the thing we have to understand about that idea of having a bias or a prejudice towards something. Prejudice simply means prejudging. It just simply means making up your mind about something without any real evidence or actual experience, but you just decided that's how it's going to be. And I think that if you look at our lives and we dig deep, we have a lot of that going on more than we'd want to admit about a lot of things and biases towards things, things that we've heard, things that we've just believed because somebody else said it without really experiencing it ourselves or really even knowing that, right? Statements that are out there and we just kind of go, oh, yeah, you know, like uh, things, things that we've heard that, you know, like I, I grew up in a place in upstate New York that wasn't really well known. It wasn't super wealthy. And so there was just kind of this mentality that rich people are snobs. It, it just kind of was an underlying thing. Like, oh, you got a lot of money. Oh, you must be one of those arrogant snobs, right? Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you've thought of that before. You know, maybe, you know, you, there's all these different biases and things that we get in our head, these statements to get there. Like if someone's overweight, they're just lazy. Or if somebody, you know, young people don't want to work. <laughs> Old people are horrible drivers, <laughs> right? Like, you know, white men can't jump. I don't know. Like, you, you, have, you, you, have, you have all these statements. Things, it, it seems ridiculous out there, but we have these prejudices, biases that get in there without even really thinking about it, and they affect how we look at people and how we're willing to neighbor them because, because we all of a sudden see them differently because of them. And, and, and I know that that's a, that's a big big topic to go into, and I'm not trying to go in all the facets today, but it's something we have to say. If we're going to cross the street, we've got to start looking at what's keeping us from doing it. And I think there's probably more there than some of us even might want to admit and how we view other people based on a lot of things that are not good. And let's just call it what it is. Any of that is, it's sin, right? Racism, prejudice, any of that, it's, that's just, it's just sin. It is. And so we got to start looking at our lives and, 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 and seeing that. And i got to tell you, that's something that in my own heart I've wrestled with because there are, there are moments when I know and I, I feel in my spirit and in my heart when I prejudge somebody on something and it just it makes me sick. And every time it happens, I have to fight with myself and ask for forgiveness from the Lord. I remember you know, a while ago, I was able to, be in a home, to take part in a homeless ministry. 
And, and part of the reason why I made sure I was a part of that is because I, just being gut level honest with you guys today, when I would walk through the city and be around a homeless person, I would get a little anxious. I would kind of already have a, an idea about them. Maybe I'd like kind of hold my wallet a little bit tighter. You know what I mean? Like, make sure I got my cell phones on me. Like, I, I, I kind of sometimes, if I was completely honest with you, I'd go across the street because I was just like, I don't know how this is going to go. It made me uncomfortable. It just did. It's just being honest with you. <laughs> but I was like, Lord, you know, I don't want to be that way anymore. I, I, identi- I see that. It makes me sick to think that I already have made up my mind about these people thinking that, oh, you know, because again, growing up and being around, the, a lot of the notion that I heard growing up is that homeless people usually are just drug addicts. That was just kind of a bias. It was a thing kind of that I had heard. And so I kind of had that in my head. I'm like, I, I don't want to, I just need to stay away. But I had this opportunity to go serve on a homeless ministry. And I did it because I'm like, I need to, I need to get over that. I need, to, I need to deal with this. I need to go get to know some of these people and see that I'm wrong. And so I went and I served and I had these conversations and I sat down with so many of these, I can only say amazing people in a lot of ways. Their stories were rough. They had things going on, how they ended up, where they ended up. But man, there were so many of those guys that, and, and girls that I talked to that just blew all of those biases and any of those things that I had going on right out of the water. And in those moments, I'm sitting there talking and in my head, I'm like almost tearing up because I'm like, I'm so sorry, Lord, that I had these ideas that, I was, that were keeping me from crossing the street to even encounter these people. And it, it, it wrecked me. And every time I feel that rise up about anything, anybody, anybody else I see, that as soon as that even notion might pop in, I'm like, no, Lord. That cannot be in my heart. Because if that is in my heart, it will stop me from seeing them, them the way you see them. And I will not cross the street the way you've called me to cross the street. And so if we're going to be those people who are willing to do that, we've got to identify those things in our lives. We've got to. See, James, there's a verse in James that says, that, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. I, mean, I didn't say that. <laughs> it's in the Bible. But we've got we to realize that, is that when, we, when we put those verses, we've got to understand that Jesus is saying this is a big deal to show, to, to, to show favoritism over people. It's a big, big deal. We've got to be willing to cross the street. And I want to show you a, a clip right now from one of my absolute all-time favorite movies. Okay? There's a clip from the movie Remember the Titans. Anybody seen this movie? Okay. This is one of those movies that I will watch over and over and over again I own it, but even if it's on TV, I'm going to sit and watch it. It's just because it's on. Because my favorite genre of movie is real-life sports story movies. And this movie, along with Rudy, Mike and I were talking earlier, probably my two favorite movies that I will watch beginning to end no matter when they're on, right? Because the message is so great. But talking about crossing the street, there's a scene in this movie where the guy, Julius, and uh, he's going to visit his friend Gary for the very first time. And he literally has to cross the street. So... Watch this. But I love that idea in that movie, if you've seen it, because, like, he literally, he's doing more, than, like, he's physically, but he's metaphorically crossing the street there to go someplace where there are a lot of barriers. Uh, and he's going to, into this person's house where, if you know anything about the story of the movie and when that took place, that was just, like, unheard of. I mean, those were talking about enemies and talking about the prejudice, talking about the things that were going on there to see that happen. And I just love when he goes into the house and hugs the mom, man. That's, that's so funny to me because she's like, I don't know what to do. And he's like, that's okay, I'm a hugger. Here you go, this is going to happen, whether you like it or not. You know, I just love that idea because he was willing to cross the street. He took the, he was scared. I mean, he, the, the police officer pulled up, he was nervous. This is not easy. First time, like, first time he'd ever had a good interaction with a cop probably at that point. And you could see the fear, you could hear the fear, but he did it. Crossed the road. He encountered somebody who was very different from him. He took the risk. He had to deal with his own, if you know the story of that movie, it's dealing with all kinds of preconceived notions and biases about people and how they got to get torn down through connecting. And I just think it's such a wonderful picture of what Jesus is trying to teach us here about how to neighbor. How to neighbor. The first step is being willing to cross the streets and showing love to people. Because the next step is we have to be willing to love those that are different than us. We just have to. And you see that in the story of the Good Samaritan because he goes over, he's the least likely person to see this Jewish guy to come over. And they, again, these people did not have a lot in common. Their, their families had been fighting for a long time. Their, their cultures and their race, they've been fighting for a long time. And he came over, he helped them, and then he took them to the end. And then the Bible says at the end of the story, I don't have it up here, but he, he says that he gave the innkeeper two silver coins and told him to look after the guy. And then if he came, when he came back, if he needed any extra money to take care of him, he would. And then Jesus turns to the guy who asked them the question. He says, so who do you think 
was the good neighbor in this scenario. And the guy's like, all right, I get it, Jesus. You just took me to school again in front of everybody. But it was the guy who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, you know what? You're exactly right. Now you go and do likewise. Now you go and do the same thing. You go and make sure that you are not only loving the people that are comfortable for you, only loving the people that look like you, only loving the people that do the things you want them to do, only loving the people that are on your side of the battle, only loving your people that are on, the, on your side of the fence. Go and do likewise in this story. How do you neighbor? Cross the street and love people that are different than you. Because here's the thing, that is a huge part of where we live today. We have to be willing to go there and we have to be willing to admit that sometimes we have a hard time doing that. Sometimes we really do have a hard time loving people that, do, that are different than us, that look different than us. I, I read an, an article this week, and maybe you saw it on the news too, that just, it made my heart happy, and it dealt with a lot of this. I want to show you the picture. It's from an article that took place, I think, down south. There's a group of, of young African-American men who were out to eat, and, uh, and they saw a single elderly um, Caucasian woman eating by herself. And they invited her to come sit with them. I want to show you the picture. That's the picture of what that looks like. <laughs> Okay, right there. Now, if you read the article, what's really cool about this is this breaks down so many things about, like, there's a lot more going on in this picture than you could even put into words. Because here's what happened. Those guys were like, one, nobody should eat by themselves. You know, I agree. <laughs> it's always nice to invite somebody over. But look, look at the differences sitting at that table right there. Look at, look at how loving somebody different and what it, what it leads to, right? Because it's not just race. It's not just skin color there that's different. It, it, it's ages, Right? She's much older. They're much younger. She's a woman. They're men. So many barriers are broken down on that snapshot that you can't even imagine. Right? And they all said, they were like, it, they found out it was, it was the anniversary of her husband's death. That, right? And she, that's why she was there. And they invited her into this, and they got to know each other. And you know what? Those guys said afterwards, they were like, that was one of the best dinners I ever had. I learned so much from her. <laughs> Just so much about different things. And she said the same thing. That changed. That was one of the nicest things that's ever been done for me. Would we assume something like that would happen very often? I think it makes the news because it doesn't happen often enough. Am I right? Like we tell those stories and they're feel good stories, but why aren't they happening all the time? They shouldn't be making the news if you're so commonplace that they're just like, that's not a story, it happens everywhere. But it makes the news because it doesn't. Because Jesus says we have to be willing to cross the street and we have to be willing to love people that are different than us. We have to. And I love that picture because it's a testimony of what the power of that can be when we love people. You can't get much different. <laughs> I mean, honestly, in that picture, you can't get much different than the people sitting at that table. You really can't. But there was, there was something that was communicated in that moment that was bigger than that. And, you know, and I don't know if any of them are believers. That's why he doesn't say if they're Christians or not. But can you imagine the power behind that? If, if Jesus is in the midst of that as well, how much that changes things? Because they're willing to go and talk to somebody who is different than them. See, what does the Bible teach us about being a believer? How does the world know that we're disciples of Jesus? By our love. By our love. It doesn't say they know you're a disciple of Jesus by how many times you go to church. It doesn't say they know you're disciples of Jesus by how big your Bible is. It doesn't say you know they're, you're a disciple of Jesus by your bumper stickers or your t-shirts. It says that they know you're a disciple of Jesus by your love. And not just loving each other, by the way. Very often we want to turn that on internally and say, well, it's how Christians love each other, they'll send a message to the world. That is very true. And that is what Jesus is saying in there, is that how we love each other as believers will send a message. But it's also how we love people who are not believers, that don't look like us, that don't come to church yet. The love that we show them makes a huge, huge difference in how we learn to neighbor people. When we cross the street, can we cross the street and love people different than us? Can we take that risk? So here's the thing, guys. We have to understand about Jesus loves everybody. Now, here's the deal. We hear that a lot. We talk about it a lot. I don't know that we live it a lot. I think that we carry things into our relationships that we're like, yeah, Jesus loves everybody. I get it, but I don't know about. Because we're going back to talking about the things that hold us back. If you have to go, in your mind, you're thinking, I'm not, I'm not prejudiced, but, I'm not biased, but, listen, if you have to add a but to that, nothing good's coming after that statement. Nothing. And Jesus is saying, listen, we got we to gotta look at this story like we just talked about the Good Samaritan and go, man, we, gotta, we, gotta, we have to go to people. This, there was nothing more different than the Samaritan and the guy that was laying there dying. There were so many things that are different. That difference didn't hold them back from crossing the street and, and showing the love of Jesus to them. 
taking care of him, meeting a need of his. So here's the thing. Galatians 3 tells us there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this is not saying that we don't have males and females. This is not saying there's not differences between people. Don't don't take this where it's not going, (laughs) right? That's not what he's saying in this verse. He's saying that in Jesus, there is no, the dividing wall of what we look like, the dividing wall of where we've come from, the dividing wall of where uh, it's not there anymore when we are in Jesus. We are all one in Jesus. There's going to be a great diversity in heaven, amen? amen? Listen, if you don't like people different from you, you're going to have a hard time in heaven. I'm sorry. It's going to be rough for you because it is going to be very, very, very different than maybe what you're used to. And you're going to be surprised with some of the people I think that we see there. See, in, John, in Revelation, John has a vision and he talks about this. And he says, Therefore before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That doesn't get much more, like, that's everybody. Right? You hear me say it all the time. If you're down south, that's all y'all. That's everybody. That just includes, there's just nobody that doesn't fit that description. That's what it's going to be like in heaven standing before the throne of Jesus. It's going to be a sea of people, and they're all going to be different. There's going to be so many different races and ethnicities, and it's going to be different. And that's awesome. Because here's what he goes on to say. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to who? Who? Right, our God. Our God. Not my God. Not just your, our God. Salvation belongs to our God. We are all, and that's a statement that includes everybody. Because then he goes on to say in Romans, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know what the Greek word for everyone is and what it means? Everyone. Like, it's not hard. It means everyone. So anyone who calls on the name of the Lord does not matter what you look like, does not matter what country you're from. If you call on the name of the Lord, if you put your faith in Jesus, there's no difference. The Lord is Lord of all in this scenario. And so we have to stop letting our differences be the thing that we go, I can't, I can't, I can't go to you. I can't love you because you're different than me. The very reason that Jesus tells this story the way he does is because they were different. This story would be a whole lot less powerful if it was a Jewish guy who went to help a Jewish guy. He's saying, listen, this is bigger than that. This is about crossing the street. This is about identifying what keeps us from loving and neighboring the people who are different from us and then doing something about it. Now, I know in this day and age, I know, they don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? Because I know that sometimes we have this idea of God is love, and you just love everybody no matter what they're doing, and that's what the culture kind of wants to tell you, is that, that if you love somebody, it means universal approval of everything that they do. That is not true. That is not what the Scripture is teaching. It's not what the Bible is teaching here. God definitely has a standard. He calls sin what it is. But to love somebody does not mean you have to go over and say, okay, I love you, you do whatever you want, God's just love. God does love everybody, but we have to stop making the battle between the person and realize that it's about sin, it's not about the person. And so when we, when we look at people that are different from us, it's not just skin colors, it's not just ethnicities, there's a lot of things going on in our culture right now that people are very, very different than maybe what you're used to or what you're comfortable with. That doesn't give us an excuse to go, well, you don't believe the way I do, I can't talk to you. Too many churches and denominations have been started over that one thing. We're too busy battling each other over disagreements that don't necessarily even matter all that much instead of going out and realizing there's lost people who are just looking at us and going, what's the matter with you guys? Because we haven't been willing to cross the street, even with each other as believers. <laughs> we haven't been able to be different and, and believe a few different things. Again, under the idea that it, Jesus is the Lord of all. <laughs> he is the one we put our faith in. He is the only one that died and rose again for our sins. He's the only one that you put your hope in to get to heaven. He has a standard to live by. The Bible is very clear on that. But outside, but let's, let's, let's get this idea back to when we love other people. It's okay if they're different from us. And we have to get past those roadblocks that keep us from going there. See, there's only one race of people. It's the human race. And Jesus died for all of them. He died for all of us. See that... This idea of how to neighbor is something that if we get this down as people, it will change the culture around us. And we've seen a lot of people that have not done this well. It's been in the news a lot of what hasn't happened well. Maybe you guys have even heard about the bombings in Sri Lanka last week, and there was another shooting in a Jewish synagogue this week you know, in, in, in California. And we need to be praying for those things, that tension around the world. 
because a lot of that stems from the fact that people have not been willing to cross the street to people who are different from them. They have not been willing to love people who are different from them. They've been willing to attack people who are different from them. They have not been willing to love people to show them what Jesus really meant about who he was. Again, not necessarily agreeing with what they do, but showing them the love that Jesus says is bigger than all of that. You've got to understand the difference. So if we're going to be people who make a difference, if we're going to be people who neighbor well, we've got to be willing to first cross the street, identify why we don't cross the street and do something about it, and be willing to step outside our comfort zones to love people who are different from us. Because like I said, the ground is level when it comes to Jesus. We have to understand that as we approach other people. So that's what I love about this story that Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan. I love the story of that, the, that, that, that parable because it reminds us just of that truth. Is that so often we can get caught in our things and realize, yeah, there's people who need help. And it's funny because you think, you think those Jewish people, you think the priests, you think the Levite, you think they didn't have any bias in that scenario? Of course they did. They're like, they're, even though he was... They're, they're, from their, their race, that he was Jewish, they were probably like, yeah, well, if he's got, he probably deserved that. For some, his lifestyle was probably such that he had that coming, you know, or whatever. I can't mess with that. We've got to be willing to attack and address the things that are keeping us from being those people that Jesus is talking about in this story, to neighbor well, so that he can say to us, hey, who was it? Okay, now you go and do likewise. And that's the message to us today. And how, and how, how are we going in neighboring? How are we going and doing likewise? How are we going and crossing the street to people who are different and loving them despite our differences? How are, we, how are we putting away the things that are roadblocks us crossing the street and making an impact in the culture around us? That's what it means to neighbor. See, Jesus doesn't tell us who to neighbor. He tells us how to neighbor. Because if you want to answer the question, who is your neighbor, the answer is very simple. The next person you come in contact with. I mean, that's a, that is really what it is. The next person you come in contact with, that is your neighbor. It could be the person that lives next to you. It could be the person that you, you, you're in line behind at Wawa. It could be, it doesn't matter. The next person you come in contact with, that is your neighbor. How are you doing at neighboring them? How are you doing at loving them? How are you? Go and do likewise. So I'm going to ask the, uh, the worship team to come back up. We're going to close and let that be our challenge. Like, I really do think this can, can you imagine what the world would be like if people got, if we, if we lived out that kind of ideal, the crossing the street, the going after people that wouldn't normally make sense for us to even have contact with, and the people would be like, what? You want, you're getting along with who? How, do, how does that even, the, the love of Jesus that transcends all of those things? What would, what would life be like? I mean, we wouldn't be hearing the news stories we're hearing today. I really believe it. We'd be hearing a lot more stories like that picture that I showed you. And out of that comes the testimony of Jesus for people to go, you know, how did you do that? How were you able to love me even though we were different? How were you able to love me even though you don't approve of how I'm living or you don't approve of this thing? How were you able to at least have those conversations? How were you able to do that? Well, you know, it's not me. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit working in me. I'm, doing, I'm trying to be faithful to what he's called me to do. So the challenge this week is will you go and do likewise? Because if we do, I think we'll see lives changed, kingdom impacted. We'll see people coming to know Jesus. That's what it's all about. So God, I thank you for today. Thank you for a chance to be here. God, I thank you that you are the God over all of it. <laughs> God, that you are, you love us no matter what. God, you've called us to be people who, like in that story, cross the street. Lord, help us to identify the things in our lives, the preconceived ideas, the notions, the biases, the things we may have heard that are keeping us from crossing the street to those who desperately need us. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see those around us that may not look like us, may not talk like us, not may not have our background, Lord, but you love them anyway. May we see your fingerprint on every single person we come across, and may we be willing to cross the street despite our differences, to love people no matter what is different between us, but because you loved us and you love them. So we thank you for that. Give us the courage this week to go and do likewise, to begin to neighbor well, in our, in our community and in our culture. And may people see the difference. Here I pray. Amen.